Today we're going to talk about Samuel Langhorne Clemens, also known as Mark Twain. He was born in a small town called Florida, Missouri, November 30th, 1835. He was born into a family of six children. His father was a judge, and then when he was four years old, the family moved to Hannibal, Missouri, which was along the banks of the Mississippi River, and this is where Twain uh, was able to come up with a lot of his storytelling ideas for his most famous novels, The Adventures of Tom Sawyer and The Adventures of Huck Finn. Now, at the age of 12, unfortunately, Twain's father passed away of pneumonia, and so <clears throat> Twain ended up working as a printer for his brother Orion's newspaper. And then at the age of 17, Twain uh, traveled to St. Louis, Missouri and worked for a printer there as well as an apprentice to a steamboat pilot. Now this is actually where Mark Twain came up with his pen name because in steamboat pilot terms a fathom is 12 feet and so when they would say um, Mark Twain that would indicate that that was uh, safe and navigable uh, waters for the steamboat. It meant two fathoms or 24 feet. And so the river trade um, kind of started falling by the wayside during the Civil War period and so he left that job and ended up um, marrying a woman by the name of Olivia Langdon. Uh, they had four children, lived in Buffalo, New York. Um, they lost one child very young in infancy and then two other daughters died in their 20s and they had one daughter, Clara, who lived to be 88. Um, but they did live there for quite a while, and this is where Twain did a lot of his writing uh, during the early um, portion of his marriage. And, and so his first um, story that was published in the New York Saturday Press was called The Celebrated Jumping Frog of Calaveras County. And then his first novel was known as Innocence Abroad, which was published in 1869. He wrote 28 books altogether and numerous short stories, letters, and sketches. Now, most recently, his autobiography was published in November of, of 2010, and it has become uh, quite uh, interesting for people because it shows a darker side of Twain. He was very bitter when he died. He was questioning his faith and just life in general um, because he had lost so many people. And so you see a different side, a different uh, nature of Twain than the humorist that we know him as. Um, he passed away April 21st, 1910, and um, his childhood home is still open to the public. It's a museum in Hannibal, Missouri, and, um, and so people, of course, visit there by the thousands every year. So the excerpt that we have in our textbook is called Life on the Mississippi, which is his story of what it was like learning to become an apprentice to a steamboat pilot on the Mississippi River. And so in your book on page 454, I'll read a little excerpt from uh, this section here where he's trying to learn how to become this pilot. And he's becoming very frustrated because there's just so much to learn and he's just not sure if he can do it. And so this is Horace Bixby, the steamboat pilot, uh, trying to tell him what he needs to do. Um, My boy, you've got to know the shape of the river perfectly. It is all that there is left to steer by on a very dark night. Everything else is blotted out and gone. But mind you, it hasn't the same shape in the night that it has in the daytime. How on earth am I going to learn it then? Well, how do you follow a hall at home in the dark? Because you know the shape of it. You can't see it. Do you mean to say that I've got to know all the million trifling variations of shape in the banks of this interminable river, as well as I know the shapes of the front hall at home? On my honor... You've got to know them better than any man ever did know the shapes of the halls in his own house. Let's look and see what Mark Twain is doing with this piece, Life on the Mississippi. First of all, he uses an extended metaphor to compare the river to a book. And so the steamboat pilot had to be the reader of this book. And in the beginning, Mark Twain was perplexed. As a cub pilot, he felt so confused. He did not know how to interpret the signs of the river and they just seemed so confusing to him that he wanted to give up. And so throughout his frustration he continued to learn and continued to understand the signs of this book, this river that he was reading. And so he writes in the end then, at the end of his tour, that he finally was able to capture it and master its meaning 
and it became as familiar to him as the alphabet. So Mark Twain had learned a lot from his experience as a Cub steamboat pilot. And uh, not only did he have a lot of positive lessons in learning to read this river, but he said that it also had its downside. He said that it lost its romance. As a boy, he looked at it through the eyes of childhood innocence, and he saw the grandeur and the beauty and the mystery of the river. And so that's, of course, what led him to want to become a steamboat pilot in the first place. But then, as he became the pilot and learned it so well, he realized that um, familiarity breeds contempt, that it loses its luster as you get closer to it, and you have to look at it with such seriousness, and you're, you know, you're so close to it each day that uh, it just loses that romanticism that you originally had. And so he talks about that in the end of this excerpt, and he says he does not env envy the physician. He compares the physician to the steamboat pilot in that the physician uh, has to become so serious about his work in, in examining the human body that he no longer can see the beauty and grace of the body because he's always having to look for underlying signs of disease. And so the end of this has sort of a melancholy tone. It starts off with perplexing uh, curiosity uh, dealing with the... Uh, the river, and then uh, by the end of it, he's learned it so well that um, he has almost a contempt. Okay, so this concludes our discussion of Life on the Mississippi by Mark Twain, and we do have three more stories that we're going to read before our exam that comes up next Thursday. So our next author in the series is Ambrose Bierce and his short story called Occurrence at Owl Creek Bridge. So thank you for watching.